Hey, what's up everybody? So, I'm here before the movie starts. Going out, we're going to see Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Now, again, I'm not doing this like I normally do where I'm sitting in the car because uh, my cousin is bumming a ride with me and I don't want her to sit in the car along with me uh, as we're meeting everybody over there for the movie. So, initial thoughts. What I kind of expect for there to be and what I'm expecting out of the movie. So, it's been 30 years, right, since the original Beetlejuice. And I I really don't know. I, I The very first trailer of it, I was a little wary of it. And the second trailer, I was kind of brought back in and being like, okay, I am interested in seeing this movie. I love Beetlejuice. It's one of those movies I grew up as a kid and probably, you know, didn't necessarily need to see it at the time um, when it was released. But, you know, it, my parents just thought it was fine. And I absolutely adored the Beetlejuice cartoon. Man, that was that was one of my favorite cartoons growing up. Any chance I got to see it, I would watch it. Um, and it, it was great. I, I loved it. And I loved the original movie so much. And the original movie used to freak me the fuck out in some scenes. Especially the transformation scene uh, between... Uh, why I can't remember their names, but Alec Baldwin and... Um, I want to say Julia Davis. Why, why can't I remember her name? Because my memory is shot... You know, just had a birthday a little while ago. Now I'm feeling even older than I am. Um, but their their transformation scene, I know somebody's going to go and put in the comments, it's fucking uh, Gina Davis, you know, some shit. But, you know, it's, it, it's not that bad when you look at it. But, you know, as a kid, especially a young kid when it first came out, prob probably not the best thing to see. Though I love the sandworm as a kid. Uh, I, I loved everything about the, you know, the land of the dead and everything like that. And, you know, this is early Tim Burton where he gets to be wacky as fuck. You know, it's just one of those things. And that's kind of what I'm hoping happens with this one. I hope that there are references to the original plan sequel that they were going to do with Beetlejuice Goes to Hawaii. I'm hoping that's in there. I'm hoping that Tim Burton gets to, like, be wacky and get back into that world because I always love his visuals. Like his visuals are usually what sell me on most of his movies. And uh, I mean, a lot of people too are gonna be surprised that probably my favorite Tim Burton movie of all time is Big Fish, um, which has some of it, but not totally. I, I just love that movie. I think Ewan McGregor is one of the best things about that movie and his character and that arc is, is really well done. And I think it's just an overall good film from Tim Burton. And it's, you know, I, I just want creativity. Uh, I love Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice. I mean, I think everybody kind of does. Uh, and I just want to see him back in the role. And that's one of the main reasons that's a selling point for me. Um, and I, you know, I've heard some things about it. I've heard some things. I haven't heard anything about the plot. Like, I don't know shit about the plot. I don't know what's about. But what I do hear and... Uh, because this is the one thing I'm going to say here at the beginning of the movie, and normally I don't listen to or read reviews or anything like that. But um, one of the things that I had heard is that there are like multiple storylines and they don't connect well. And, and ultimately that, you know, it's a fun movie, but it's, you know, that there, there just isn't that, it's not solid in that regard. So, you know, and then there's there's a couple other people, you know, I was, I was watching a, you know, a Twitch stream earlier today and there were some people that were talking about it in the chat, you know, and they were saying certain things and I, I really don't, you know, because it's their opinion, that's their opinion. This is going to be my opinion that you're coming for if you're watching this review. So looking forward, again, just looking forward to seeing it and we'll see how it goes. Um, like I said, based upon the second trailer, I, I felt a lot better than I did with the first trailer and uh, we'll see if it's... Um, I don't want to be that one that guy and say, like, we'll see if it's worth the 30-year wait. Uh, because I don't think really many movies are if they're just not in the zeitgeist of, you know, our pop culture right now. And that's one of those things with this movie. Like, I don't expect this movie, other than the people that were really big fans of it back in the day, you know. And, and here's one of the opinions I got out of there. My parents saw it. My parents loved it. You know, my parents are in their 70s. And so it's like... Okay, and, and they have a love for the original as well. But my parents also, at times, are very easily, like, amused. It's bad to say that, but there are some things that, like... I'm not sure how you like that. But again, it's their, like, tastes versus my tastes. 
So when it comes to movies and everything like that. So I, I get it. I understand it. And uh, I, like I said, I just want to have fun. That's the biggest thing. If I have fun in this movie, I'll really enjoy this movie. You know, I'll, I'll still do what I normally do. And I'll still, you know, talk my shit and do that type of thing. But I, what I just really want is something fun. So we'll be back after the movie is done and uh, we'll give you a review. All right. See you in just a moment. Hey, what's up, everybody? I am back from the theater after seeing Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. So uh, I talked about it a little bit beforehand. And while there are problems with the movie, there there are quite a few problems, I would say, just in general. The overall movie is is actually really fun. I had a lot of fun watching it. I think that it was nice kind of sliding back into that role, you know, for Michael Keaton in being Beetlejuice. It's like he never left and he just, it still felt like the original fucking character. Like I was very surprised. I wasn't sure how it was going to, you know, I thought, I thought that it was going to be fine. Right. But I didn't think it was going to be like that nostalgic to see that character. And that's really a lot of what this movie hangs on is nostalgia, right? And there's a lot of like, oh my God, there's this. Oh my God, there's that. Oh my God. Like you you recognize a ton of things in the movie and there, Catherine O'Hara is probably the best part of this movie, to be honest, for me personally. I thought that she was absolutely wonderful. I think that like the, the role that she played in this movie and it, it was really hard too with the the dad of the movie, um, and I always screw up the guy's names. George Jeffries, I believe, who played the original, and I could be completely wrong um, with that, but it, to me, it sounds right. Uh, he, like, he's not in this movie, but he's featured a bunch, which is very weird. I mean, he's the one of the story arcs in this movie is that he's dead, and that's what's bringing everybody together, right? And they do some cool stuff with it in the beginning. But, you know, the actor is very troubled, and that can be a problem. And one of the things, like, when I was talking with, you know, Pat about it after we finished the movie was I wonder, you know, one, they probably own his likeness for the movie, and that's what they did. Or they talked to the estate. You know, he's still alive. It's not like he's dead or anything like that. But, like, look, we've, we've got to use his likeness, and we're going to do it, but we're going to donate the money that he would normally get to whatever fund, right? Like, that's what I'm hoping. I don't know, personally, or is it just that, hey, we own the likeness of the character, so anything that's just imagery of him, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, he's not going to get a dime. He's not going to get anything from it. But, in a way, it was, like, I know that if he wasn't such a piece of crap that it would be perfectly fine to have him in this movie. And in fact, there is a little bit that's missed with him not being also, you know, without Orko as well, but you know, that actor has, you know, passed away since. Um, but there's a lot of like really goodness to just the, the character being there, even though the, the actor is terrible, right. In, in what it is, if you want to know what he did, you look him up. I'm, I'm not going to go into it here. Um, the the other things there's you know strong performances from Jenny Ortega I think that she was pretty good in the movie pretty strong overall and you know the the acting wasn't that bad the the only one that I felt maybe was a little out of place which is really funny because it's the the main character that we're looking at besides Beetlejuice and that's Winona Ryder like there's just something about her like it didn't quite feel like Lydia I I'm just kind of gonna say that right. Not bad, but I just didn't feel that character like you felt her back in the 80s when she did the role in 88. Now, one of the things that I was thinking about when it came to this movie was, you know, what is what was the rating for the original? And I had to think back, like, when did, you know, Temple of Doom come out? Because that's when you really had the first PG-13. And I feel like it was a PG-13 movie in general. It wasn't definitely wasn't an R right because it did have some harsh language in it not not a whole lot but it had a quite a few you know words that went through so that would have at least made it a PG13 overall so while it's not like terrible and i believe that this is also PG13 and there's even a censor in it as well where i was just kind of like why is this in here like it didn't make any sense why not just say it but maybe that they did it it's comedic in the way that it's done but it totally threw me for a loop when it happened right so, I mean, overall, 
the the biggest issue I have with this movie is what I talked about in my like intro and what I was expecting and what I read. And I would have thought about this either way, even if I hadn't read that at all. But I was like, oh, is it really going to be like that? Or is there something different? No, there are so many just random storylines in this movie that it just like they don't come together well. There are, at least when you start the movie, there's at least two, maybe three storylines that are going on. And I think by the end, there was like five or six that had to wrap up at the end of the movie. And I was like, one of them that's from the beginning of the movie, it doesn't even, like, I feel like it's such a non sequitur that it didn't even need to be in there. There was, There's characters in this movie that I'm just like, why? Why do we even need this? After the conclusion of the movie, like there's plenty of ways that I think the movie could have been, you know, streamlined in terms of the way it is. I know there are three writers that wrote the story and there's only two script writers for this, but it's just that part's a mess. Everything else, what it comes out of it, the enjoyment from it is very good. But if I look at it from that angle, it's it's just a complete and utter mess, and I don't know why you need to have certain characters in it. And so, you know, the the two people that maybe feel a little out of place in this movie are, are, are Monica Bellucci and uh, our good old friend Willem Dafoe. Uh, while the characters are fine, it just it's we it feels weird. Like I think if we had just focused on the you know the main people that were involved and yeah you can involve daughters and all those you know siblings and whatever you want to do into the film not siblings but like you know Lydia's family I I'm okay with that but it's still like uh, we'll talk about it in the spoilers because I really can't talk about it too much in depth without spoiling everything about it and I'll probably do that right off the way like and just kind of go through that stuff like where where I felt like the movie like the biggest issues with the movies but the humor's great the sets look fantastic a lot of practical effects and puppetry in this uh there is even some things that you see in there there's claymation that's see I don't know if it's all claymation or if it is CGI that's meant to mimic claymation and it but it looks great and when it uses it it uses it very very well and there's a couple of things that I'm kind of like, there was one thing in particular that I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it kind of does, but you should at least know what something is or where this comes from. Like, it's weird. But, you know, overall, I had a very good time. But because of the mess of the story, uh, the, the final rating for this is a solid three out of five, uh, three out of five sandworms. It's just... I think that there's so much of a mess that's going on and that if that was fine-tooled or they didn't try to go so broad with everything in the story and just focus down on just a couple of things, it would have been a much better cohesive movie in terms of the story. But from the humor to Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice to references to the original movie, uh, the, the sets, the puppetry, all that stuff, really, really fucking cool. I really enjoyed it. And there's even a cool little Easter egg at the end of the movie for it's only within the movie itself. And I was very surprised and I laughed when I saw it. And it's something that happens at the beginning of the credits. So it's nothing that's post credits. But I think that if you love the original Beetlejuice, I think that you're going to really like this one overall. Um, I know that there are some people that have called it like, you know, mid. Um, I think it's better than mid. I know my rating is like middle ground. It's a three, right? So put it in somebody else's score. You know, it might be like a five. But if you put it out of 10 for me, it'd be like a seven, right? Which is a very serviceable score. It's not a bad score. It's not a great score. But it's something that you can have a lot of fun with. And again, like it's cool to actually see a lot of people go in there and bring their kids, kind of like what my parents did as a kid, right? To go see this movie. Maybe I'm not supposed to be there and seeing it. And some of these kids might not be there, but like they're sharing something that they really loved as a kid and now sharing it with their kids. So it's cool. And it's this type of movie, you know? It's something that appeals to like the inner goth and in a lot of people, right? Like I said, I grew up on this movie, and I grew up on the, the cartoon. 
I, I absolutely love them. And I had the same feelings when I was watching it. I, you know, there wasn't a time where I didn't have a smile on my face and I wasn't, there was nothing that other than what I reflected on afterwards, there was nothing that I would be like, ah, oh, God, I just cannot recommend this movie at all. So uh, that's it for this portion of it. We're going to go right into spoilers. So I'll see you guys in just a little bit. So now we are entering the spoiler section for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. And the the biggest, like I said, the biggest complaint I have about this movie just in general is that it has too many plot threads in this movie. And the most like ridiculous one in it is the fact with Monica Bellucci's character. That's the one that I'm like, you could have just done without that plot line together. Because the basic story, uh, and it's so hard to be like the basic story of the movie. One I guess Beetlejuice eventually got out of the line. I would have loved to have seen something where Beetlejuice, like he actually was going and finishing his whole thing in, in the waiting room. And there's a lot of references to the waiting room in this movie as well with all these different characters. And I wish that he had gone through, like it finally you had him and like maybe even had started with him directly getting out of the line finally, and then going off to doing what he's doing. Right. But you have her character and you have a great cameo. Uh, it's a very short cameo, but it's a great cameo by uh, Danny DeVito in the beginning of the movie. And he like they, they knock over some boxes and she pops out and she's like all in pieces. And who she is is Beetlejuice's ex-wife. And they go through it in, in the movie basically saying oh, you kind of find out how Beetlejuice died. Right. There's a whole little section in there where, you know, it was way back. in. I think he was Italian. I'm pretty sure he was speaking Italian and he's doing the story in front of all the the workers that he has. Right. He runs basically he's turned what he did into a giant business where he's now like, you know, kind of pimping himself out to get rid of people and be a part of their thing. Um, but it seems like it's primarily in the underworld while he's still pining for Lydia. And so. You know, they show what happened to him, and he was like, he was a grave robber. And so he went, and while he was robbing a grave, he uh, all of a sudden saw this woman who was absolutely beautiful, married her shortly after, had a great night of sex with her, as they, they like, the coitus was great, like that type of thing. And then what he found out is that she's part of some death soul sucker cut cult that's there. And. Hold on, I'm going to do this again. And then he finds out that he, she's some part of some, like, soul sucker cult that's out there, right? And within that cult, she's got to, you know, marry him and then make him, like, like, fall in love with her. And then she's supposed to kill him and take his soul so she could be immortal, right? And so she's come back to life. But he, he killed her. He axed her before, you know, she could actually kill him, like, fully kill him. She poisoned the wine that he gave, like, she gave him. And, you know, so before he died, he killed her so she couldn't steal his soul. And so, you know, she, I guess she's been in these boxes in the underworld for a long time. And when somebody is running through, there's a, a scene in the beginning of the movie, right? So the movie itself, I know I'm jumping a little bit, but this is all happening towards, except for the story, happens in the beginning of the movie where we see what Lydia's been doing, right? And she's basically using the, her ability to see ghosts, to do a TV show and she's doing this TV show and she's talking about, you know, these ghosts in these people's house. And uh, then she sees G Beetlejuice in the audience and freaks out. And she goes to talk to her mom because her mom is also calling her. Right. And leaving her message saying, there's something about your dad. You need to come goes to talk to her dad or her mom. And when she talks, she finds out that her dad died in a great fucking, if it's claymation, it's wonderful. If it's the way the CGI is done in the style of claymation, it's still fucking wonderful. But they go through the whole experience of her dad getting eaten by a shark. And this scene is relatively funny. Like, it's literally like, you know, he went he went on like some bird watching expedition. And then <laughs> the plane crashes, but he survives the plane crash. She's like, oh, no, you know, the, the plane crash, that's something he always feared. No, that's not what happened to him. Well, then he, he drowned? Well, 
he almost drowned. And then they show him he, he managed to get on top of a wing. And then when he got on top of the wing, you know, that's when a shark came and, and bit him like in half. And so they do show him in the underworld, right? So the dad is still in the movie, but because the shark bit him, like all of this is completely gone. And it just, every time he talks, it's like splits blood outside of like the hole in his neck. And I, th that was fucking hilarious every time it happened to me. I think that was really imaginative. It was a great way to keep the character in the movie without having to have the actor be in the movie at all. But when you see like the stop motion slash CGI or whatever it is, like it's, it's definitely the dad. And I was like, okay, if they're doing like likeness type things, that's kind of cool. But then you see a ton of pictures of him all over the goddamn place. And so you know, because of that, because of the dad dying, like somebody she's having work because she's now this like huge artist after everything that she's done. And she's like famous in the big city, wherever the big city is. And she's got some like French like graffiti artist that's supposed to be doing something with her, like spray painting her as well, as spray painting a wall. And because the dad died and. I, again, I love Catherine O'Hara in this movie. Like she's supposed to be like, you know, you're supposed to be sad. And she's like talking about being sad, but she's just like so fucking chipper the entire time. Again, it's it's like the original movie to me, but I feel like she was maybe a little more stern. Like she was really into her art in the original movie, but I, I just feel like even when dealing with Lydia and a couple of things, she was not so jovial. Where in here, she's like super jovial all the time, no matter what's going on with the whole thing. And she's weird as hell. And I think that this character was written perfectly and her storyline is fine. Like her storyline is eventually meeting back up with her husband. That's that's literally it. Husband dies, she's dealing with the grief, and then eventually she dies at one point in the movie and then meets up with the husband at the end. That's like her storyline. That's perfectly fine. I have no problem with that that storyline in particular. But she like so the guy runs out and he dies. He falls down a manhole. And then he's like in, you know, the underworld runs into Danny DeVito, who is cleaning around. And as he's cleaning the floor, he accidentally does the floor buffer and it shorts out on some water and which knocks over a bunch of things because he knocks down. And that brings Monica Bellucci back and she's out to find Beetlejuice to claim his soul. And she's a soul sucker. Right. So she when she like Danny DeVito's trying to talk trash to her. She grabs him and then sucks out his soul and then, like, compresses the body down into, like, a little even shorter version of Danny DeVito and then leaves the soul there. And she does this a couple of times throughout the movie. And unfortunately, she also gets one of the characters, which is – it's one of those – like, you've seen it all over the place. It's been in commercials. It's the guys with the shrunken heads. But there's one in particular named Bob, and unfortunately, Bob gets it towards the end of the movie. But you have her looking for Beetlejuice. So – I was like, these two storylines are fine, right? So you have, you know, and Lydia's estranged from her daughter, played by Jenny Ortega. Uh, I want to call her like, it's like a Stratus or something like that. I, I, her name is really odd, right? It, like really, really odd. And so she, you know, Jenny Ortega is estranged from her mom because, you know, her dad died and then her mom, you know, Lydia went to like a self-help group and then she met this guy who is the worst fucking character in this movie. The boyfriend and I, I'm the actor's name right now because I do these like directly after I just forget actor's name. So please excuse me. But her boyfriend is the most useless character in this whole fucking movie. And like, you can tell that he's just putting on a show the entire time and he only wants to be for Lydia with her, like for her money and what she can do and the money he can make off of her. Right. And he met her at this like couple suffering retreat. Right. So people that have dealt with ones that have lost love, you know, they've died or whatever it is and met her there. And he was basically, which he admits to based upon a truth serum that happens at the end of the movie that, you know, he was only with her so that, you know, he he only went to it so he could find some lady that he could take advantage of and take the money out of. But it's so, like, obvious that that's the only reason that he wants anything to do with Lydia is just for her money. Because he's always talking about uh, the show and us and the show and how all this stuff is going to work out for them and everything like that. So, I it, it's just sufferable. And I know the, the, like, I praise the actor because the character is so sufferable. But the, I just don't like that character. That was, to me, that was just the worst thing. Like, it is just 
ham-fisted stereotypes from like the 90s of like the crunchy hippie guy that is just all about peace and love and understanding and you know oh he at one point you know they're gonna do it's halloween and so instead of the candy that they're gonna pass out to the kids he takes it and throws it all away and goes and buys carrots and fucking strawberries and shit to put in little bags to give to the kids because that's better for them like it's all those types of things and you know and Again, he, he has this scene, you know, they go back, you know, eventually that's what they do. They all, you know, he, she's trying to get a hold of her daughter. They go to the school that she's at. And I was really like, this is just a call to Wednesday, like the way that it is, you know, and it's not exactly Wednesday, but she's at an all girls school. She's kind of the odd one out there because her mom is Lydia Dietz. There's a funny scene where like they're talking to her. Uh, Delia and Lydia are talking to the daughter and trying to talk about the you know the fact that her grandfather has passed away. And they're sitting out there, and then you see the sculpture that from the original movie, the one that like wraps around her with the like claw type things that it looks like that's out there. And then you also see. Um, like that the whole art wing has been donated by Delia and, and everything that's there. And it's, it's a pretty funny scene in the way that it's done, but I just was getting those vibes, those Wednesday type of vibes from this. And like, I kind of felt like I shouldn't have been getting those vibes, you know, but I, I get it. It's just Jenny Ortega at a girl's school. It's not really what it's meant to be. You know, it's not a, a preppy school. It's a specifically girl school that's there. So you know, uh, so they end up going back, you know, and of course he's there and he's trying to be like, I can be the good father. I want to be a father figure in her life. You know, like this is fucking liar, liar and fucking Carrie Ou's character in that movie. You know, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. It's the claw. I'm going to get you. That type of thing. Like, it's just, he, again, he's so sufferable and it's just the, the character that I absolutely despise. Um, so they go back, they have the funeral, that's where you get the Deo, Deo from the trailer type thing, which I thought that was kind of cool. And it's very, they make sure that you know that Delia has become even more eclectic in the way and she's more infused in the inner artist that she is, which is fine for what it is. It's not like a, a big deal that's there, but it's like, at it, times it seems like it's really over the top. But it's the performance from Catherine O'Hara again that makes me okay with what they did with that character. Why one character can be over the top and I absolutely despise that character to another character being really over the top, but I absolutely love it. And I think it's just the nostalgia factor that goes in with, you know, Delia Dietz in that, that character in this world. And so, like, there's two characters already I can completely do without. I can do without the storyline because that's another storyline is – you know, when they have the funeral and they do like the wake at the house and, you know, uh, her daughter doesn't believe that her mom can actually see ghosts and she grifts because her since her dad is dead, she's like, why can you not see my dad? And they don't really explain that. They just at one point, they basically like there's a whole nother another thing that, like I said, this movie is filled with nothing but different storylines in this movie. And it's, it drives me fucking mad uh, in the way that it's done. I'll get to that in a second because they don't ever talk about it. And there, the dad of course is going to show up in this movie. Uh, I kind of guessed that it was going to happen, but if you're going to do that, like just leave the boyfriend alone, you know, like maybe it, the the daughter's mad because you know again the daughter is mad because she can't see her dead you know husband her father and you know maybe that's something that Lydia is like struggling with and she's trying to be like I do see ghosts and the daughter doesn't believe in it and you know then eventually when we get into the the underworld that you know when we see the dad then we can you know they can reconcile in that way just kind of like what they did in the movie so you know, while that's all going on and the daughter's getting mad about things and everybody's outside. And it's it's funny, too, because the house is like draped in these black, like sheer drape. And one of the there's a the realtor. I, I'm not sure if that's a realtor from the original movie or not, but she's there with like her little daughter. And then the daughter looks up. And she's like, why is this all covered in this black fabric? And Delia is just like. Oh, it's the morning period. The house is in mourning itself. Like that shit to me is so funny and so well done. And it's the things that I really like about this movie in, in the way that it is. But of course, the boyfriend decides that this is the perfect time that they need to get married. 
right? We're going to present this. And he kind of forces Lydia into a corner, you know, and there's a parallel between what Beetlejuice did, you know, to her in the first movie and kind of what he's doing to her here, where she's just like, you know, she doesn't really want to go through with it, but then she kind of just acquiesces and is just like, I guess so. I guess I'll marry you. And then they're going to do it on Halloween, which is only two days away from what they're doing inside the movie. So that, of course, gets her daughter pissed off. Her daughter goes and grabs Lydia's bike from the first movie, which also happened to be Gene Davis's bike, uh, and goes into town and where she almost gets hit by a couple of cars. And that's where we get the next plot of the movie. Right. And we also get to meet in hell as, you know, Monica Bellucci's character is causing havoc down there. Uh, we get to meet, uh, God, who we get to meet Willem Dafoe's character. Who's this cop. He's like, uh, a death cop type thing. Like he handles, like he's a death detective, I guess you could say, where he handles the, the things going on in the underworld that, you know, they still have rules and people breaking the rules and bringing them in, but he's an actor. And like, I think the character has some funny moments. Again, I just don't know why it is. Like there's, he always has this thing that he's got to like pose and he has a secretary that always comes in with a cup of coffee, which is, it's absurd, but it's pretty funny at the same time. And then, like, there's even one time where, like, he does it and he purposely crushes it. And then he throws down the cup. And then you see that there's a wastebasket that's just overfilled with crushed cups. And even one thing where he's, like, having this great speech to all of the, you know, other cops that he's going to go send out on something. And then the secretary's back there with cue cards, like, holding him up. Like, those things are funny. But his storyline is trying to catch Monica Bellucci's character and it's just kind of like so small and sparse in between the whole movie that it it's not even worthwhile like tracking the whole thing down so you know we get to see that in the underworld scene you know, like me skipping over these things it's like i i that's not is that's not the main plot of the the movie and i don't even know what the main plot of the movie is even by this point so she goes out the daughter goes out and there's also like she goes upstairs and she has a heart to heart with lydia in the attic where you see the big diorama that's out there and you know and she actually the daughter finds a flyer the beetlejuice flyer which magically appears because beetlejuice finds out that they're back in town and they're you know he's going to try to figure out a way you know to get back in there because he also gets pulled into the station as they're talking about the whole thing with his ex and that the ex is searching for him because she put it up on the walls after she killed danny devito and again when she kills uh this dry cleaner and we see the father for the first time in his like headless thing and everything like that and so you know because she's trying to find where beetlejuice is and so he gets pulled in with the detective and when he's pulled in there they take him out to the scene and ask him questions about it and then when he first sees it you know he gets like the eyes popping out and all that stuff again beetlejuice is fucking great in this movie um and so the he wants to go to get with Lydia again because if he marries her and goes back to the real world, he can avoid being getting his soul sucked out by his ex. That's that's the basic point of that that thing. I think they could have just again ignored the ex plot line and just did kind of what they're doing with this whole thing, which leads you into the other plot and another bad guy. So right now, you know, technically Beetlejuice is a bad guy, right? of this movie he's an antagonist of this movie and monica bellucci's character is an antagonist of this movie so that's two the boyfriend is an antagonist of this movie that's three and the fourth antagonist of this movie happens to deal with the daughter because after she's upstairs she sees the beetlejuice thing and she just kind of looks at it and just throws it aside but she's more interested and she finds like an old album of pictures of her dad and her and her mom all together and Lydia has good heart to heart with her. And then she sees the paper and she's like, where did you find that? You know, because she's been seeing visions of Beetlejuice every now and then. And even Beetlejuice says, you know, he's got like her photo on his desk where he works, where all the shrunken head guys are. And his main dude is Bob, who he dresses up as him to be the person in front to get his soul sucked out. So that way Beetlejuice doesn't get his soul sucked out. And they're just working hard doing his business, like I said before, which I think is just like, like separating, like basically killing people for other people, right? 
if they call in, then he can set up like he was talking about. Yeah, I'll frame it on her like she's having an affair and then I'll kill her. And you're none the wiser that anything's going on. You get off scot-free and then she's down here with me. She tries to explain to her daughter why she shouldn't see it, but she like keeps it to herself. Like she just kind of gets mad at her and is like, you can't say that because after she says it twice, she doesn't say it a third time. But that still brings into the model again the Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice like sign that's there and that points to where he's at. And so that's when she gets mad and she leaves. And then she's going through the town on the bike and she ends up crashing through a fence because she almost gets hit by a car because she's not paying attention to what's going around her. And then she ends up at this like um, this treehouse and there's a, a dude inside of it. And he's like, you know, kind of a cute dude. And so he's reading Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. And then, like, you know, she talks to him for a little bit. And she's like, he's like, well, can you come by? I'm always a place if you want to come by, you know, later. And I'll, I'll help you out with whatever you got if you're having problems with your mom. Because she hangs out with him for a little while. Turns out that he's dead. And she can see ghosts too, right? And, like, there's a scene where he brings her into the house and, like, the mom's in the kitchen. She's like, oh, he, she just panic bakes all the time. And then the father's always watching TV, watching Wheel of Fortune. And he's just sitting there watching the TV the whole time. Because when the fence breaks, she's like, well, look, my mom will pay for it, you know, so don't worry about it. He's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. They'll never notice anything. And I'm like, okay, he's dead. Like, I kind of knew right there. I'm like, he's a ghost. The family's a ghost. Like, if he's not a ghost, then the parents are dead and the parents are ghosts when they go inside and that's the eventuality thing. And he, what he's trying to do is trying to seduce her in a way so that she reads from the book, you know, the, the guide to being dead book that they have and reads a passage to where she's going to exchange her soul for his soul so that he can come back to the real world. And then she'll be dead and she'll be stuck down there. And she passes through uh, going on the soul train and, the Soul Train, it made me cringe a little bit, but it also made me laugh in a way because literally it's the Soul Train. Like if you know the old 70s show, the Soul Train, where the people were dancing with all the music and the disco lights and shit like that, that's what the train is. All the people are outside, all dressed like that, dancing outside. And I want to say the conductor was the actual host of the Soul Train show, but I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure with that. Basically, that's... That's the plot line that I think kind of does work because what ends up happening is that, you know, she ends up talking to her mom. They reconcile and she says, oh, I want to go see a boy on the night that they're going to get married. She's like, that's OK. As long as I pick you up by 10 and you still come to my wedding, you know. And so when she goes over there, she gets tricked and taken to the underworld. When she goes, Lydia goes back home to talk to the realtor after the mom is signing all the papers and everything. And her mom, D Delia is also like, she's going to go to her husband's grave. And it's great because this is great glass shark fin with his picture on it. And it's like, you know, he got killed by a shark. So that's, you know, the way that he'd want his headstone to be. I love everything with Delia in this movie. I think it's all of it's fucking hilarious for the most part. Uh, so she gets these two asps and she's going to do this like thing and she's going to let the asps like she's going to hold them up. And so, you know, of course, that ends up with her. The asps, they happen to be not defanged like she thought. So she gets swindled. And so they bite her on the neck and they kill her. And so she gets sent to the underworld and she's in the lobby. Like you're constantly going to that lobby area in this and seeing all the cool costumes and everything for the people. The sets don't feel as big in this movie. They feel sometimes smaller and cheaper than they did in the original movie. Like it's, it's like they did it. And, and the thing is, is that they still have some good visuals, but I felt that the original visuals of the underworld were way better in the original Beetlejuice. Like, they could have spent some money on that. Like, it feels like they weren't sure on how much to spend in this movie. And I don't know off the top of my head how much this movie costs, right? I'm guessing it's over $100 million to do this movie. But maybe they did it for 80 Maybe they did it for 70 I don't really know. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll put, like, something down there that says exactly how much this movie was made for. But I really feel like the sets for the Underworld part aren't as interesting as everything above. Because, like, the artwork section, the house looks absolutely beautiful. The the town and everything that surrounds all the crazy stuff that Delia has, 
looks great, but it looks kind of plain when you go downstairs, other than the makeup for the different dead people that you see and the ways that they died. Like, there's a guy that has, like, a ton of hot dogs in his mouth, like he was trying to fit them all in there and choked on a hot dog. There's another guy that was, like, he's like Houdini or something like that, but he tried to fit himself inside a really small crate, and he's all scrunched and, you know, in there. There's, uh... <laughs> I feel like it's a nod to Terrifier, but it's not like the Terrifier three. There's a Santa Claus that's burned himself to death, right? And it's funny because like when uh, you know uh, Jenny or Kedtega sees him first, and she's like, "Oh, Merry Christmas!" Like, <laughs> Merry Christmas! Like, it's cool. I I like the way that that's done. Like again, there's a lot of really cool there's cool visuals but it doesn't feel as alive as it did in the original movie especially when like you know the 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 two ghosts are being led and you're seeing all the people working and the papers going everywhere and you got the one dude that's like you know he's like this and he's sliding through all the things and dropping off papers like there isn't anything that's interesting like that but there are interesting characters that are down there lydia sees the the realtor person and they talk about it and said, no, there's that that's not a good house. I've been trying to sell that house for years. That's where the son offed his two parents. And then the, you know, the cops, when they were trying to, you know, get to him, he went up to his treetop house, then he fell down and he cracked his neck and he died. And, you know, she he showed her daughter that, oh yeah, I fell out the tree house and I broke my neck. That's just how I died. So and I thought that they were really going to try to do like a parallel with him and be like he, you know, the only way that we can do is if, you know, you marry me, then I'll come back to the real world and everything be fine. So do like a parallel with Beetlejuice, but just another dead guy. But the, like the thing was is that he was basically tricking her because he was an, an evil dude. That sends Lydia into the, the underworld to go and save the day. Basically, you know, bring her daughter back. And that's where we meet the husband, right? The husband is working behind the counter in like... There's a section where I forgot what they called it. It, uh, it it basically is where like she gets her picture taken and they change the bodies and he then he has to get his like passport stamped and this stamp will then allow him to to take the ride that goes back to the surface because she agreed by reciting whatever it was inside of the book that she would switch places with him and then she goes like I said on the soul train and goes you know off to the afterlife. And, and goes, I, I guess the train is what takes you to actually being fulfilled rather than being a ghost with, you know, in that world instead. And so, so she decides that, and there's, again, there's a, there is a good scene where like Lydia is trying to talk to the, the douchebag boyfriend and, you know, she's like, I'm going to tell you something really weird, but you have to agree with me that you're not going to think it's weird at all. Right. And then she explains the Beetlejuice thing to him. And then after she explains the Beetlejuice thing to him, he's, you know, and she try he tries to say the word once, but he, she stops him mid sentence. And then after she explains the whole thing and he's just like, yeah, sure. Okay. You know, I'm doing this for you to make you better. And he goes, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. And then they get sent into Beetlejuice's office where, and it's a wild scene. I really enjoyed this scene. And you get a little bit from the trailer where he's like, you know, he's looking at them on the couch and then there's like the monsters that pop out, but you're only behind him in the thing. Um, but he's like, he's basically like a couples therapist with them. And then when he sees, okay, it's time for everybody to spill their guts. And then like he opens his shirt and all of his guts fall out. Like, again, it, it's good prop gags. And then there's... <laughs> There's even a point, and he's like, I'm about to have my child right now. And he points over at Lydia, whose stomach grows really big, and then out pops a Beetlejuice baby and starts, like, gnawing on her leg. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely after her father. Like, <laughs> it's funny. I like this little – again, anything with Beetlejuice in this movie is just absolutely fantastic. And so because she knows he's around, and she – and what's weird is I thought that she had to say his name three times for him to go away, right? But she says home three times, and I don't remember that. But she says, home, home, home. And then she gets sent back home with her, her boyfriend who thinks that he just dreamed the whole thing instead. So because Lydia's in the underworld, she has to call upon Beetlejuice to bring Beetlejuice back so that way that he can take her down there to rescue her daughter. So that, I think, even though it's a little cliche, that should have been the overall movie. That should have just been the plot of the movie. I think you should have had 
like Lydia seeing Beetlejuice from here there, still dealing with a little bit of the trauma that's there now that she can see ghosts on a regular basis. And, you know, maybe she tried to put her away and she's dealing with the trauma that she can't see her husband, though she can see all these types of ghosts everywhere. But instead, she, you know, it's just she can't deal with that fact and her daughter thinks that she's a liar because she can't see her dad and then goes into this whole thing where she goes into the underworld you know get rid of monica bellucci's character completely you can get rid of willem dafoe unless of course you still use willem dafoe as trying to like hunt down beetlejuice and stop his like little agency that he's doing because it's an illegal agency even beetlejuice is like kind of holed up in the middle of like nowhere right with all of his little worker dudes and so he, you know, at that point, he agrees to help Lydia and, you know, he bombs into his own office and, and this doesn't get resolved either, which is, it's just weird, but like, he's like, okay, don't make sure none of them escape. Like all the workers that he's got and he's Bob, you're my number one guy. Make sure they don't escape. It's the worst field of juice. I know I'm doing my best here with it. And so instead, of course, they all run into the we- real world and we see them all over town and there, there's one hilarious scene where like one of them is inside a shop and like they're in like a a a market or something like that or like a you know a convenience store a little small convenience store and like he's just fucking throwing money because they're buying as much real world shit as they possibly can like all the food and stuff that they missed and then there's other people like they're riding scooters and just enjoying life outside of the underworld it's great i i really it's it's short but it's perfect so, and again, like the things that I have problems with are the plots that really go nowhere. Because even at this point, you know, we've seen his ex kill two people and she's still searching for him, right? And then we have Willem Dafoe, like constantly getting these crime scenes and doing this stuff, but he's like just in it. He and Monica Bellucci are in it as much as Beetlejuice is in the original. Beetlejuice is way more in this movie than he was in the original. I think he tops out at five minutes. In the original movie, I it might even maybe closer to ten, but it's not very much that he's in the original movie. And in this, he's probably in it for about fifteen, so he got a little more screen time with this. So now they go back, you know, into the underworld to track down her. And there's a scene like, so the dad sees Jenny Ortega as she's being taken to the Soul Train. And there's one point, like, they're going down the hallways, and she's like, do you know where this place is? He's like, yeah, you're going to go uh, straight down this hallway, then to the right, to the left, to the left, then to the right. And then what, what about you? Are you coming? Oh, I got to use a little boy's room. And so he goes to, the, like, the, the bathroom and goes off camera, and you don't see him for a while. And then we follow Lydia to the Soul Train, where she goes inside the train, and she pulls her daughter out. And then as they're being chased, because she has to complete the transaction, she has to be on the train. And so they end up going through one of the exit doors, which takes them to where the sandworms are. And this is where I was talking about, I don't know if this is claymation or if this is CGI. The sandworms look fucking awesome, right? And it felt like claymation, but I think it was CGI to look like that. If that's the case, they did a really good job with this to make it feel like it was the original movie and the claymation sandworms that they had in that movie. I love that they didn't try to change the look and feel of the way the sandworms were. I think that that was a really good choice for them. And again, they kept a lot of the stuff very, very similar. But again, some of that stuff feels really empty. And to, to try to get into the, the end and wrap this this whole thing up with all these things, we we end up, you know, she ends up getting Lydia out there. They go to stop the dude, right? And like they're while they're trapped in the world, the dad saves them. And then the dad's just like, I'm sorry that I couldn't see you, but you two need each other. That's it. Like, why can't you see him? Why can't he explain where he's just like, you know, you couldn't see me because you can see everybody else, but you can't see the ones that you love. Like, even if that's like a shitty explanation, tell us. Like, I feel like because you spent so much time doing other shit, you could have had a moment here where they talked and they like, because it's a really short scene where they all like get back together. And then it's just like a kumbaya. We're going to fucking hug it out. And you guys really need to each other and you need to, you know, you should become stronger because of this and, and these types of things. Like they could have spent more time as they were like, say, searching for the dude that has her soul and trying to figure out a way to get past Beetlejuice. You know, him being upset that the fact that she agrees because to get Beetlejuice's help, she agrees to marry him, right? She signs the contract and everything like that that Beetlejuice has made for her. And so, you know, when they finally catch up to the dude man, 
he's getting his passport stamped. And then when he gets his passport stamped, and they're like, don't stamp that. And the dude stamps it. And then, you know, he looks up. He's like, ha ha. And then it's Beetlejuice behind the counter. And, yeah, you should, uh, you should look at that thing over there. And when he opens up the passport, it says shit out of luck, which is funny. Again, you say shit multiple times in this movie. But the one word you don't say, you censor. And it's weird. So... They end up getting, you know, because they, they get him and he's not able to board where he needs a board to go back. They end up, you know, it nullifies the deal. They bring her back up to the you know, real world. And now she's there. Lydia's there. And now Lydia has to go get married to Douchebag, right? Douchebag McGee. And so we go to the church. And this is like the final thing. And I know I'm missing a couple of things here or there in the movie, but they're really not important. To everything that's going on, mostly we get some like you know visual gags, sight gags here or there that we have in there, um, and again some of the time with Beetlejuice. But they go to the church, and you know the dude has set up a bunch of social influencers to be there to take pictures so that it boosts the show because they're getting married and it's everywhere, and that's when Beetlejuice shows up. And he does actually probably one of the cooler, it's a weird effect, but it's kind of, it's an interesting idea and a cool idea where like, you know, all the influencers are like recording the whole thing and, you know, and he stops the wedding from happening. He's going to have the wedding. And then he looks to all of them and he's like, no, well, this is where you guys, uh, you know, you disappear. And then they all get like sucked into their phones through like they all slowly like zombies turn it, and, you know, the cameras towards them and then they get sucked and you see all the pictures like their faces as their lock screens on the phone, which I thought was a really interesting idea and kind of cool. And it, it looks OK. It's not the best part of the movie for everything that's there. So and now we get the big dance number of the movie or the big musical number. Just like we had the Deo in the first movie, right? Where we had them all like dancing around being like, you know, with all the ghosts doing all the stuff. Instead, in this one, we have Beetlejuice using MacArthur Park. It's it's weird. It and I did not like this as much as I like the original. I know they're trying to capture some of that magic. And this was one of those things like you you don't actually need this one in there. I know you wanted to do like you hit some of the original beats in it but it wasn't like excessive and you most of your original beats were like nostalgia like markers right so from characters to places to a couple of things that you see in the background and in, in, in different spots that's where those things hit with like those member berries right if you want to talk about those types of things but this was trying to capitalize or not capitalize that's that's the wrong word i want like emulate that scene but try to make it more grandiose and it was more grandiose but it just didn't fit right so like the part of it is is that like there's a cake and they're like they're all singing parts and he's forcing everybody to sing parts of it of of you know, macarthur park as the cake is out there and the cake's like raining down, like icing off the sides, you know, of course, you know, like I said, Delia, she went down, she made a deal with Beetlejuice to find Lydia and that, you know, and so that way that she can get out of there uh, as well. Right. Or, or find a way out. And then she ends up eventually, like I said, seeing her husband down there where like she looks at it's funny too when she finally does see him after she gets taken back to the underworld at the end of the film and like he's missing you know again like i said all of this you know it's just a gaping maw that's there and she's like look what they did to me and like, it's it's fucking hilarious i i love it uh but yeah so there's the big this big dance number and eventually the ex shows up monica bellucci's character like she's been gone like she, and she does suck the soul out of bob which sucks like Bob, like you like the character and it, again, because he's so silly and he's dressed up as Beetlejuice and he's got the hair. He's a shrunken head guy, but with Beetlejuice hair and wearing the stripes and all that stuff like that. And she approaches him. Where is Beetlejuice? And like, you've been looking for him the entire movie, but now you, why? Who gives a shit? Like, again, that character can just be struck from the entire fucking movie. Like he just does not need to be in the movie at all. Like, or she doesn't need to be in the movie at all, period. And so, you know, and then you have the cop. He's about to raid the wedding that Beetlejuice is doing everything at. And so, basically, she shows up, and then he, he like, convinces her that the fiancé is the one that really she should be in love with. Because look at it, like, he, like, tears off his clothes, and he's wearing, like, an I love whatever her name is. I forgot what her name is. 
I love Monica Bellucci. I love Monica Bellucci too, by the way. So you want to meet up sometime, Monica? But nonetheless, and so she seems like she's going to go off to him because now he's going to be marrying Lydia. And they put her in the, the Lydia Deeds, the dress, the wedding dress from the first movie as well. But eventually the cops break in. He freezes all the cops, right? There's a, a cool model. And I, again, I don't know if it's CG or if this is practical of Willem Dafoe as his character, like frozen as the priest is like hiding behind him. And if that was a real like model, it's fucking amazing. If that was practical, if it's CG, it still looks pretty good. But I, I swear that it is 100% practical for what that is. And so eventually what happens is that, you know, they all get distracted. The, the ex and the boyfriend get crushed by something. And then uh, Jenny Ortega is able to read through the book and when she finds out is that because he brought her into the underworld, brought Lydia into the underworld, and he's not supposed to, his contract is null and void. And so Lydia then says, Beetlejuice, 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 three times fast, blows him up like a balloon, and then he's back down in hell. And then all of a sudden, all the cops are unfrozen, and Willem Dafoe looks over her and like, you guys are good for the living. And like his thing is that he was an act, like I said, he was an actor, so he's constantly like posing. He's like, if you want to take that selfie with me, you can take that selfie. And he like moves around. Like it's funny, but again, I just don't think the characters needed at all. And so mom goes back to hell, meets up with the dad. Uh, you know, Lydia and her daughter now have all reconciled with each other, and everybody's happy at the end. And then there's a montage of all the actors as their characters. And this is the Easter egg that I was talking about. It's not, I wouldn't say it's an Easter egg. That's maybe the wrong thing to do, but it's a cool little thing they do at the end. All of the, the shrunken head guys that have been running around, they all have names. And he gave them all names, and they all get their names at the end of the credits, including Bob. And for Bob, they give like his, because if your soul gets sucked out, you die forever. It's like a second death, and you can't come back from the second death because your soul's now gone forever. And so they put in there, and it's like, you know, 1988 to 2024 or something like that. I forgot what exactly years that he did for him. So, I mean, that's that's Beetlejuice. Uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. So, like I said, I don't think it's as good as original. I think that you had way too many plot threads going on. So many just don't go anywhere. So many characters are, I think, just useless. I think... I think the, the detective, Willem Dafoe's character is useless. I think that, you know, Monica Bellucci is useless. I definitely think the boyfriend is fucking useless. And that whole wedding, like, they could still do everything they did if it really just came down to her having to get Beetlejuice's health because her daughter decided to do this thing and go get into the underworld for this guy. And you spend a lot more time down there with Beetlejuice and Lydia right? Like a buddy cop type of thing. But Beetlejuice has a nefarious plan because he's still enamored with Lydia and he's trying to figure out a way to get back with her, right? And so he agrees to do this on this one thing. And then you, you know, then he has the heel turn at the end of the movie when it comes out that, yeah, you know, I agreed to marry him and you do all of everything that you did, you know, basically here for this. So like, again, I had, I had a lot of fun with this movie. Don't think I didn't have fun with this movie. It's just the story. It's just way too many plot threads to make something that could have been just really simple, right? And I feel like if you didn't spend so much time on all these little extra things, because even like, I think the scene with Monica Bellucci putting herself to ba back together is cool. It doesn't look that great. I You can tell that it was used in other areas and that wasn't one of the areas. Like even when like the face is like coming together on it, it's just like it looks fine as it's floating, but then when it's like morphing into the face, it doesn't look right. But then it's cool, for, like having her like staple her head together again. I think it's a cool character. Like, why not do that and then have him like have Beetlejuice instead reach to Lydia for help, you know, and say like, look, I, I need you to figure out a way to get rid of my my you know ex wife or. Just spend a whole time on just Beetlejuice in hell, and that's the story, is that this person's coming to, like, suck the life out of him, and he's trying to figure out how to get away from this whole thing. And then we get Beetlejuice antics for the whole movie. So, if you guys saw the movie, let me know what you thought down below. I'd really appreciate it. For that, all the links and everything down below. If you like the content, like, subscribe. I'm going to head out of here. Thank you guys so much for watching uh, this review. Take care of yourselves and each other.